Medical Museum tonight. Um, hopefully you're all here to listen to John Axline. He is a historian for the Montana Department of uh, Transportation. And he, well, I'm going to read the bio that he sent because I think it's great. So it says, while not sweating over the state's historic roads and bridges, he conducts cultural resource surveys and writes the Montana Department of Transportation's roadside historical and geological interpretive markers. He is the author of many articles on the Montana history of, wide, of a wide variety of subjects, ranging from dinosaurs to railroads, Montana jerks, Cold War radar stations, flying saucers, MDT port of entry stations, and the reason you're all here tonight, <laughs> World War II Japanese balloon bombs that have appeared, these articles have appeared in the Montana Magazine of Western History and Montana Magazine to name just a few. He is also the author of Conveniences Sorely Needed, Montana's Historic Highway Bridges, and the editor of Montana's Historical Highway Markers. And I also would like to make a brief announcement that this event will be videotaped this evening by Missoula Community Access Television as a part of a media assistance grants program for nonprofit organizations. And if you would like more information about this grant program, you can contact MCAT at 5426228. And I will turn it over to John. Thank you. Fun. Well, thank you for coming tonight. Am I talking loud enough? Um, this is really the first time I've lectured about this subject. And it's really something I didn't know anything about seven months ago, other than rumor that uh, that Montana was really the, the the first place where they they discovered a Japanese balloon bomb during World War II, and. Uh, so actually how I found out about it is about the way that the information was disseminated in the first place. It was all through rumor and, and uh, loose lips pretty much that, uh, that the information got out about the bombs. So please bear with me tonight because you're really my test case on this. So if um, I start to wander or whatever, please, please let me know. Um, I also learned that if I'm ever going to do a presentation, the best way to start it is with a dog. <laughs> so does anybody recognize where that picture was taken? Perhaps? It's, the site doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, thanks to the MDT. Is it, is it up by Fort Benton? No, nope, this is uh, where you come over the hill on US 93 and looking down at, um, at uh, Polson and Flathead Lake. Oh, okay. So I believe there's a highway there now, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, Unfortunately, yeah, I don't know whatever happened to the dog either. I've always kind of wondered. <laughs> but uh, it's just my nature, I guess. I can get it to go to the next one. There we go. Um, tonight I'm going to talk about Japanese balloon bombs. And Montana was really a long ways from the fighting during World War II, but for five months from December 1944 to July 1944, or April 1945, we were really, Montana was, was really at the front lines of, of the war, and mainly because the Japanese, as, not really as a last ditch attempt to try and turn the tide of the war, but more as a, as a way to kind of to cause some morale problems here in the United States, had decided to uh, launch an air assault against North America using balloons. Um, very primitive technology um, at that time. That primitive technology really helped them out because they could manufacture a lot of balloons and do it very cheaply. So, and I'll get to that here in, in just a second. But mainly what, what I look at this also as is a sort of a foretaste of the Cold War because Montana now again is on the front lines, or was again on the front lines of the Cold War because we had the missile silos based here along with, um, along with Malmstrom Air Force Base. So. Uh, so no matter how far away we think the events that are taking place worldwide are happening, that a lot of the time that um, Montana is a lot closer to it than you'd think. And so with that, I'll, I'll kind of launch into the subject. Um, by late 1944, it had become clear even to the Japanese that the Japanese that Japan was losing World War II. So looking for ways to inflict damage on North Amer on the North American continent, even at the that they, they launched this balloon assault against the U.S. 
Um, this was called the Fugo Project. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, the project actually began in 1942 in, in Japan, but it had its antecedents in 1933 when I think they were developing this type of, of, of weapon for use against China before World War II started. Um, more popularly, it was known as the windship weapons, which I think probably sound a little bit more um, more romantic, perhaps, in, in Japanese than it does than it does in English. The plan was to launch balloons that could use the jet stream to sail to the United States and Canada, where it would deposit incendiary and anti-personnel bombs. And the plan really was um, the incendiary bombs would theoretically set our forests on fire that would divert um, resources to fighting those forest fires or else they may, if they were lucky, drop on, um, on war production plants or um, as what happened, or, uh, unfortunately, in one case that one of the balloon bombs actually landed in Oregon and a family got a little bit too close and tampered with it and set the bombs off and it killed six members of, of a family in, in Oregon who were out for a picnic one day. So it's really the only time the balloons really function in the way that the Japanese intended them to. Um, unfortunately, there's a, for the Japanese, there's a five-month window when you could launch these balloons where the jet stream would carry them over to the United States, but um, that would occur during the, the winter months and early spring when it's really too wet in the forest to really ignite them. So there was really no hope that the bombs would really work the way that, that the Japanese intended them to. Um, it was not intended, they were not intended as a game-changing weapon. They were intended mostly as a psychological and a terror weapon because you never knew where these things were going to drop and theoretically that um, everybody could be, could be a victim of them at some point. During the course of that five month period from, from November to, uh, to April, six months I guess, that the Japanese launched 9,300 balloons towards the United States. And that's an incredible number of balloons. And how many do you think actually got here? A couple hundred. A couple hundred, less than 10% of the balloons actually landed in the United States, Canada, and even Mexico. Two of them did land in Mexico. That's the couple That's hundred that were found. Well, I was going to get to that. I was going to get to that. We know of the couple, couple hundred. Yeah. yeah, but there could be others out there that we haven't found yet. You're right. You're absolutely right. So, but um, still, I think it was mostly an unsuccessful program. Um, it didn't do what it was intended to do for the Japanese. There were some mechanical problems with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the equipment, so they didn't work correctly. And the best part is, and the part that I liked the best, because you wouldn't really expect it, it was one of the best kept secrets in the United States. That the, uh, the uh, United States government and military had asked people, or asked the media, not to report on Japanese balloon bombs. And they didn't. And so the Japanese had absolutely no idea if any of these bombs ever got here anyway. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's, that's probably the best thing that could have happened for the U.S. in, in this case. That um, everybody clammed up and they didn't say anything and, and the Japanese didn't know what was, if, the, if the balloons were even getting here. Um, this is a diagram of what one of the balloons looked like, basically. Uh, this is the Type A balloon that was developed by the Japanese Army. Japanese Navy was also developing their own version of the balloon bomb that was made out of a rubberized balloon instead of a paper balloon like the, uh, the Army's version was. Um, the Japanese Army and Navy didn't get along very well together and they didn't cooperate at all. And uh, that was a problem they had all during the war, that there wasn't much cooperation between the, the services. And so we got the paper balloons. We didn't get the rubber balloons. And I don't know if it really would have made any difference at all, but uh, but, uh, but that's, that's how, the, how the things shook out. Um, now, we're, you're right, a couple hundred balloons. Yes, sir? Yeah, what, are, what is the diameter approximately? Ah, you're going to ask me that. Okay. I do actually have that information. They're 32 feet in diameter. Um, each balloon was made out of 600 pieces of paper. Um, they were four-ply and Japanese school children made them. <laughs> um, this is kind of, you know, more so in the Japan than the United States that the war effort really did trickle down to everybody. And so the Japanese, Japanese children made these things. Uh, the balloons were filled with hydrogen. 
and the hydrogen was manufactured at, at certain sites around Japan, and it's used, credit to the fact that um, the, ja the American Air Force had pretty much made those plants unusable during the bombing raids, that that's one of the reasons it's given for the, for the end of the, the Fugo pro program in, in 1945. Um, you ever had sandbag ballast, um, they had 19 foot shroud lines, so you know they were fairly fairly easy to spot once they were, you saw them in the air. Uh, they're really a cream color balloon with um, light green or blue lettering on it. Uh, one thing that the uh, the American um, intelligence forces could discern pretty easily is where the balloons were made and where they were launched and when they were launched. And uh, the Japanese, just like the Germans and everybody else, kept pretty good records, even on the balloons themselves, about, um, about their, their production and, and usage. Um, each one of them had a rising sun symbol on it. And, and then, of course, the Japanese lettering, which really clued the people who found these things originally that, um, that they were Japanese in origin and not, and not a, a U.S. Army Air Force um, balloon. They had an al automatic altitude control device. Um, you can see up there in the upper uh, right-hand side, they were all had flash bombs attached to them. They were supposed to set the balloons on fire as well. Each balloon was designed to carry an anti-personnel bomb as well as five incendiary bombs. So they, their payloads ranged anywhere from 25 to 75 pounds each. When these things were found, though, mostly what was found was rem remnants of the balloons and the shroud lines. A lot of the times, some of the equipment would still be attached. Um, I think in only a few cases were the bombs still attached to the, to the balloons. So um, that was one of the problems is this altitude control device kind of gave, when it reached a certain altitude and a certain distance, it was supposed to drop the bombs and, and that, that device malfunctioned. And so most of the ones that were found didn't have the bombs attached to them. Um, in a few cases, there was reports of people hearing explosions and then finding bomb fragments or problem parts of the balloons later. So they did get over here, and some of them did actually explode, but um, most of them exploded in midair and, and didn't, <coughs> and didn't uh, actually drop their bombs on anybody. Uh, again, there was 9,300 of these things that were launched. Um, I think that's an incredible number of balloons, considering we only found 285 of them. So that's less than 10% of the total number that were, uh, that were launched that were actually found. Um, they landed in 17 states across the western United States, and they also landed in, in western Canada. Uh, two were found in Mexico, and uh, the rest, most majority of them were found here in the United States. And I think you're absolutely right. There's probably more of them that were just never, never found. That tissue would have deteriorated after a short period of time. And so, uh, I mean, there could be things out there still that somebody will run across someday. And then we'll have to change the number that actually landed. Um, the last one that was discovered during the war was in Nevada in July of 1945. Um, but they did find one here in, in Montana, about a, a few miles southwest of Basin in southwestern Montana in uh, 1947. So they were still finding them rather late in the, uh, in the process. And this is what they looked like when they were in flight. Interestingly, and this is how I became interested in it, was the first balloon bomb that was discovered in the United States was found 17 miles southwest of Kalispell in December of 1944. So, Mo so Montana was really on the front line and we were, we were responsible for finding the very first one. Um, the authorities didn't really know what to do with it though. You know, they, in fact, they didn't even really know what it was. And that wasn't until later when, uh, when the Army and the FBI kind of clued them in on it that they, they, they really d discovered what it was that they found in uh, southwest of Kalispell. And I'll get to that here in just a second. Um, when they were launched, it took about three days for them to get to the United States from Japan, and that's moving approximately uh, 200 miles an hour at altitudes of anywhere from 30 to 38,000 feet. So those things were really moving along once they were launched. I mean, three days to get here from Japan. Um, I think at that time also the jet stream wasn't really understood. 
very well by scientists and meteorologists. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I don't think the Japanese really knew how they were going to work any better than, than we understood how they got here at that, that time either. It wouldn't be until later that, that the jet stream was really better, better known. Again, these things were fairly low tech. I mean, a balloon with bombs attached to them. I mean, the highest tech part of it was the device that, that actually dropped the bombs. Yes, ma'am? I'm still stuck back on the little kids making these bombs. What were they? These were many pieces of paper stuck together? 600 pieces of paper on each one of what, them. What, what held it together? Must have been some kind of a paste or a glue. Huh. So it is kind of amazing. You know, it is to me interesting that Japanese school children made this. But, you know, the entire society was mobilized during the war. To, uh, to help fight that war, so I guess it, it really shouldn't be a surprise. Yes, sir, you had a question. Yeah, did you also mention there was a, a different composition? They used rubber or something? Yeah, the, uh, the Navy, the balloons developed by the Navy used rubber. Oh. Yeah, the, the balloons developed by the Army used paper. And they, the rubber ones were sent somewhere else? I don't think that, that program really got off the ground, because so rubber would have been harder to get a hold of after a while, because at that time, really, I think the best, the best uh, source of it was in Indo Indochina. And of course, they were in the process of being pushed out of there. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like you know they were they must have been rationing rubber just as much as, as we were over here. And again, this part down here is what um, what malfunctioned and dropped the bombs prematurely. I assume a lot of the bombs were probably dropped over the ocean and and not over land. Thirty-two of the bombs, the 285 bombs. This is another photo of what the what the payload. There seems to be differences in how the uh, the payload was was arranged as well. This is a, a recreation of a Japanese um, the payload from a Japanese bomb that's in one of the museums back east. And um, there's a sandbag sandbag ballast down here, and then this would have been the, the bombs up there above. Just to kind of give you an idea of what, what they actually look like. Now, 32 of the bombs, or 30, well, let me, let me take that back. I was wrong. 285 incidents reported about balloons that, uh, that reached the United States. In actuality, there was only 120 balloons that were recovered, not the 285. And what I think with the 285, I think a lot of that, again, is all rumor and innuendo that um, we're not sure if that's exactly how many bombs got here. And I'll, I'll get to that here again in, in just a second. This is the memorial in near um, in Gearhart Mountain, uh, Oregon, that commemorates and memorializes the six people that were killed by a balloon bomb there in, in 1945, the spring of 1945. It's the only time that the balloons actually worked. Um, and just to back up again very quickly, 120 balloons were recovered, 32 of those were recovered here in Montana. So Montana actually had the second largest number of balloons that landed in the United States. And anybody have an idea what, what state might have had more balloons than us? Oregon? Nope. What? Oregon? Oregon. Oregon had more balloons than we did. Damn it. <laughs> yes, sir. Does MHS have any fragments of those in no. its possession? No, there's, I think, probably a lot of fragments that are floating around, but the Historical Society doesn't have them. In fact, they don't have a very good collection of photos either, as we'll see here in, in just a second. This is a photograph that was taken out of one of the, the Kalispell newspaper after the discovery of that balloon in, in December of 1944, and I'll get to that um, right now. To get my notes here in order, I apologize. So the first nearly complete balloon bomb recovered in the United States was found on the Truman Creek, uh, on Truman Creek, about 17 <coughs> miles southwest of Kalispell, on December 11, 1944. There was two men, father and a son, named Oscar and Owen Hill. They were out collecting slabs of lumber <coughs> uh, along the creek in, in December of that year, and they found the balloon and thought originally that it was a parachute. <laughs> And so they went into town, reported it to the sheriff, and the sheriff came back out the following day and, and retrieved it and brought it into, into Kalispell. Now, interestingly, I don't know if any of you ever heard of a magazine called Reminiscence. Reminiscence? Yeah. Did any of you read it? Yeah. I mean, I got my, my May issue finally last week, 
<laughs> and I was sitting there reading it in the in my chair at home, and uh, my wife was on the laptop doing whatever it was she was doing, and there was a little article in Reminiscence about written by the brother of or the son and brother of, of the two men that found the bomb. <laughs> and uh, so there was a nice little explanation about how it sounded like from the letter that, that the Hills actually brought the bomb into Kalispell and it wasn't the sheriff as, as, as it's been reported. And, but there was an awful lot about the fact that the Hills made a living off of collecting lumber sla or l logging slabs <laughs> to sell in Kalispell and they weren't going to give up selling that, bringing that stuff in to bring in the balloon. And actually the balloon was of secondary importance to them. And uh, I hadn't heard that before. And I had absolutely no idea that anybody from that family was still still alive and reading that magazine. So it was really kind of a nice little nice little aside. And I was whooped with joy when I told my wife about it. And she said, oh, really? <laughs> so obviously, we have different interests when it comes to this, to this subject. It was probably more interesting on the computer, which she was looking at. Uh, again, the balloon was covered with light green camouflage, had Japanese lettering and a rising sun symbol on it. So I think once the sheriff saw it, he realized that it was something that's not supposed to be there. I mean, there was a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment in Montana during the war, and getting that type of, uh, finding that type of thing in the woods probably did cause a little concern to the sheriff and, and, uh, and other people in that area. They think the bomb landed sometime between November 11th and November 25th. And the only way they could tell that was that there was snow underneath the, the uh, what was left of the uh, the payload of the bomb. And there must have been snow on top of it as, as well. So they were able to tell when it landed, or about when it landed. And there was information on the balloon itself that told them when it was launched. So they know it was launched on a certain date in November 1944. When the balloon was recovered, um, the sheriff contacted um, an FBI, FBI agent named W.O. Bannister, who was in Butte, and he came up to uh, Kalispell to try and determine what it was that they'd found in the woods. And that's um, Mr. Bannister there on the, on the right. So this must be the, uh, the balloon bomb that was found outside of Kalispell. Because I don't know if he really got involved in any of the other recoveries during, during that, that time. Now, rumors spread fast. In you know, wartime, rumors spread pretty quickly. Yeah, well, they spread pretty quickly any time of the, of the year, as, as we all know. And it wasn't long before the information had gotten out about the thing being recovered in the woods. That it was stored in the sheriff department garage, and pretty soon 500 people had already showed up to take a look at it. So there must not have been a whole lot going on in Kalispell at that time to get that kind of attention. But, um, but shortly thereafter, the FBI did ask the uh, people of Kalispell not to talk about it. And I think it was mostly because they didn't know exactly what it, they had and they didn't know how it really fit into any, anything else that might be going on with the Japanese that, that there might be some concerns about. Now, the problem was, it is a small area, there's not that many people, everybody knows everybody else. And the mailman in that area heard about this shortly after it was found. And he was from Libby, his name was Joe Kujawa, and I did look him up in the census because I thought it was ironic if it was a, a, a man of Japanese descent that found it. But um, Kujawa, I believe, is a, is a Finnish name. And so he had, had no connection to the, to the Japanese. So he marches back up to Libby, talks to the Western News up there, and says this thing was large enough to hold six to eight, six to eight men and it had Jap flags on both ends of it. Yeah, I use the quote Jap because that was in the, in the article. And as far as I know, that was really the only newspaper account of what happened. It came out of the Libby Western News. Um, so, you know, again, it, could, it shows again that uh, how bad rumors could be, you know, if we're already thinking that there's, um, these balloons are bringing in, you know, Japanese guerrillas to, to Montana. You can imagine the kind of feeling that that would cause among many of the, of the people, and a lot of fear and, and hysteria that they probably really didn't need at that time. The uh, editor, the publisher of the uh, Daily Interlake up there, a man named by the last name of Spofford, said that, quote, everybody was mighty interested, but when the FBI warned us not to discuss it, the town clammed up. So information wasn't getting out about this thing. 
not officially, but it was getting out through rumor, and so by word of mouth, and so the information spread rather quickly across the state. Um, I guess that's another version of the old moccasin telegraph from the, from the late 1800s with the, with the Indians. Again, the, the cow spell balloon was just the balloon itself, the paper envelope that it came with. Um, included a gas relief valve, which is at the bottom of the envelope itself, or the balloon itself. Um, had shroud lines, which is what's found mostly and when these things are recovered. Shock absorbers, I don't know what they need those for, but mm -hmm. that was part of it. And the envelope destructor, that these things were supposed to self-destruct after they dropped their, their load. So I mean, imagine being a paper envelope that a little firebomb device on it would have sent it, and with hydrogen would have sent it off pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, it was only in a few cases that intact balloons were actually found. That um, not very often did you get the whole package with the balloon shroud lines with the bombs and, and the, whole, the whole works. Mostly it's just pieces and parts that were found here in the United States. Time and Newsweek magazine did pick up this story. And they did report on it, but they didn't report on it exactly what it was that had been found. And so they said, quote, Residents of Kalispell were engaged in fascinating discussion, discussion about what odd people the Japanese were. That it was a mystery to them. Nobody really knew exactly at that time what, what, was, what this was. But despite that, the U.S. Office of Censorship requested a news blackout for the uh, newspapers and the radio so the Japanese wouldn't get any information about these things actually arriving here in the United States. And that amazingly worked. I mean, rumor is fine, but if it's in the public, you know, if it's in the press or on the radio, then the chance the Japanese might hear about it. But, um, but that news blackout was so good, the Japanese didn't know about it. And, uh, and so that was really, again, contributed to the termination of the program in, in April 1945. So again, word of mouth got out, people knew about them, and so pretty soon you start hearing all kinds of uh, substantiated, unsubstantiated reports about it. Um, the best one that I like is uh, the a fully laden balloon bomb landed in the field west of Kessler School in, in Helena. Now I went and checked the newspaper, and of course there's nothing in there about any kind of a balloon landing in the field west of Kessler School. In, uh, I believe it was in March or April 1945. Um, even in the official records, there's no mention of that particular incident happening. So what you see in a lot in the newspapers after the news blackout had been lifted is a lot of, of reports that didn't actually ever happen. And there was really no way to confirm them or uh, to unconfirm them at, at that time. This is a very poor photograph showing one of the remnants of a balloon with the shroud lines and some of the equipment. Yeah, another version, I believe this must have been in southwestern Montana, someplace. Um, amazingly, most of the balloons were found east of the Continental Divide. And I think they were mostly intended to land in the forests of the west of, west of the divide, but most of them made it to the east. Uh, most of the bombs were found in Beaverhead County and in uh, Bighorn County. And they found one even as far away as, as Carter County in southeastern Montana. But uh, Bighorn and Beaverhead had the most balloon bombs that landed there. Um, unfortunately, none, well, maybe fortunately, none landed here in Missoula County. <coughs> but there was a few over on Horse uh, Nine Mile Prairie by Greeno. It must have been fairly close to the, uh, the Powell County border. And there was some down in the, uh, the Bitterroot Valley as well. One of them supposedly landed at a place called Riverdale but I haven't been able to positively identify where that is, but I suspect it might have been in the Bitterroot as, as well. So there's at least two that were uh, landed in the Bitterroot Valley, one at Sula and the other one at Riverdale, wherever, wherever that one was. Again, only Oregon had more balloon bombs recoveries than Montana. Um, Alaska Territory had 32, which was exactly the same number that landed here in Montana, 32 balloon bombs that they, were, that they found. Um, again, another one was found in 1947, so really the, the number should be 33. Um, story that, that I like is, uh, I'm trying to track this down because I think maybe the, the Carbon County Museum might have a, a piece of the bomb, is that one did land in a field west of the little town of Silesia. How many, how many of you know where Silesia is? 
How many of you been to Red Lodge? Salesia, you go right through Salesia. The only thing that's there is a, is a Mexican restaurant. But it was a little bit more hopping of a town during World War II. And uh, they did have one that landed in a field west of Silesia, a few miles west of Silesia, east of Silesia, excuse me. And one of the farmers, or ranchers, went out there with a pair of scissors and started cutting pieces of it off before the FBI got there. <laughs> so those pieces must be circulating around somewhere. And I think, um, judging by the, the status of the collections at the, at the uh, Peaks to Plain Museum and Red Lodge, it's quite possible that they may have, a, have one or not know what it is. So you just kind of hope they don't um, get rid of it, thinking it's just a, a piece of paper. Uh, after so, the, excuse me? Sure. So the picture that's there, what we can, to me, it looks like it's all rolled up? Yeah. Now, all of them were recovered, and they were taken someplace. Okay. But I'm not sure where they were taken. I haven't seen anything in the, in the records about where the things were went. I don't know if they analyzed them, if they just burned them or, or what. But, um, yeah, they, they took them somewhere, but I just haven't discovered where. Let's see if there's another one of it. Yeah, there's another, another one. So this is mostly what they were finding. Um, they did uh, hear an explosion outside of the little town of Glen. I bet nobody knows where Glen is. All right, good, good. So you know, where can, is it? Glen is uh, <laughs> just north of Dillon. Um, yeah, it actually has its own interchange. But uh, when you get into Glen, there's nothing there. But uh, but some somebody who was living in that area did hear one explode, and then they went out and they did find uh, fragments of the bomb and then the remnants of the balloon. The only one that was recovered intact with its bombs and the and the balloon itself and the shroud lines and all the other equipment uh, was found outside of Whitehall by a rancher down there. Um, whatever happened to it, again, I don't know. Um, the one that was found in 1947 outside a basin was just left where it was. Uh, nobody really, it was pretty badly deteriorated and there wasn't any, you know, um, stuff associated with it, so they just, they just let it stay where it was, it rotted away. Yes, sir? In 1997, I read a little article in the paper that a bomb was found uh, near Dillon. Yeah. And it described the bomb. Yep, that could be. It could be. Yeah. Um, for some reason, I don't know why they all, a lot of them landed in Beaverhead County. I mean, it's, it's, I thought more of them would have landed, you know, before they hit the Continental Divide, but most of them went over the Continental Divide into, into the eastern part. Well, there must be a lot of those aluminum rings that survived, didn't they? That are still I would there. assume so. Yeah. Yeah, they just haven't been picked found. up. Yeah. They might have been found and somebody didn't know what they were. Well, that's true, you know, and I, I keep thinking, I remember um, when I was younger of hearing about a plane that crashed in the Bitterroot Mountains, and it wasn't found again for 20 years afterwards, so, I mean, there could be still a lot of stuff out there, but it'll be just the equipment itself, it won't be the, it won't be, and whether they used aluminum, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it was made it, of aluminum. Was it made of aluminum? 24 inches yeah. in diameter, so it's yeah. pretty good size. Yeah, it is pretty good size, so, it's amazing they, they still have the capacity to make that aluminum that late in the war, considering what was what was going on there. Um, after the bomb was found, or balloon was found outside of Kalispell, the U.S. Forest Service um, initiated something called Operation Firefly. And they hired Earl Cooley to fly an airplane around the forest looking for bombs that either hadn't landed yet, or balloons that hadn't landed yet, or those that had. And I don't know how many he actually found, but, um, but he was out there, the highway patrol, was looking for these things, and, and this was provides a connection to the MDT. All of our maintenance guys were looking for them as well. So anybody who was associated with the state or with the federal authorities in, in Montana was really uh, tasked with, with looking for them. And so there are a lot of reports that came not only from them but from civilians about seeing balloons flying over somewhere or another. But um, whether those were actually something they saw or something they imagined they saw, I, I don't know. I think it it's must be a lot like the flying saucer craze that started in 1947. That Once the, the rumors had started that you should be looking up and looking for these things, and of course everybody was seeing them. So, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Was there ever a report of airplanes encountering these flying bombs? Um, no, not, not in Montana. But there were fighter pilots who were trained to shoot them down off the west coast. 
And so there was some that were shot down before they ever they ever reached here. So it must have been kind of good practice for them because it wouldn't have been dangerous at all at that point. So, um, so it, I mean, it must have been kind of exciting, you know. Here we are in Montana, and nothing ever happens in Montana, right? And all of a sudden, you know, we should be looking for what the Japanese might be, you know, singling us out for attack, you know, and trying to destroy our morale and burn down our forests and, and whatever. So, I mean, it probably added a little bit of excitement to the time, especially as the war is winding down and everybody's kind of tired of it and they're ready to, uh, to get move on to, some, to something else. Uh, the last balloon bomb that was found in Montana was found near Monida. Now you all know where Monida is. And uh, that was found on July 6, 1945. Um, it reached that far I mean, before before it landed. Um, and again, the last one that was found in Montana was, was it, after the war was in, in August of 1947. So is this really important, do you think? Could have been. Could have been if, this, if it actually worked, you know. It could have done exactly what the Japanese wanted it to do. It was really a morale breaker more than anything else. And, uh, and also to, to divert resources to fight in forest fires or, you know, or whatever. But, um, so really it is a terror weapon more than it is anything else. I mean, it's just the thought of what might happen that, that really causes people to worry. Yes, sir? Wasn't there a concern during the war that this might be a form of germ warfare? Yes. Um, the Japanese were actually experimenting with, with biological warfare. And uh, although nothing really um, appears again in the press, I mean, most of what you see about the whole balloon incident is really what it, it was written after the war was over. Um, but there is some concerns that they could be doing that as well. But I don't think the Japanese thought that far ahead, or maybe their biological weapons program wasn't that far advanced, and uh, and uh, and they didn't they didn't do it. So I don't know if it's really important. I think it's an interesting sidelight to America, to Montana history. I think it's an interesting sidelight to World War II. Um, it's got some interest to me as well because it's really the first intercontinental weapon. I mean, it's really a harbinger of, the, of nuclear missiles, ICBMs, during the 1950s, 60s. Um, admittedly, a lot more low tech and, and a lot less dangerous, but. I think what it does is go to show Montanans and other people is we're not immune from what's going on overseas. That even what's going on in, in, in the Pacific could have some kind of an impact on us here besides, the, you know, unfortunately, the casualty counts and that type of thing. That Japan was, you know, it's kind of a last gasp for them. And, uh, and they didn't, I think, didn't really expect anything really to come of it. But, um, of course, nothing did in their minds because they didn't know it had even gotten here. So um, I'm not talking very long, Carolyn. Is that all right? No, I I'm thinking maybe D.B. Cooper's in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Um, I think I have one more. Here's a here's a, a map that shows where the balloons actually landed. Um, again, you can see most of them are, are east of the Continental Divide. They're not here in western Montana, where all the forests really are. Um, a few down there in, in Beaverhead County in the southwest, but amazingly, most of them got as far as, as southeastern Montana um, and were found there. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, a, you know, as a historian, I'm kind of interested in this kind of stuff anyway. And uh, it was like, it was whole new to me. You know, I knew they were, they were Japanese balloon bombs, but I didn't know that they'd ever reached here. Yes, sir. I think one was found uh, clear back uh, near Chicago. Yeah, they, they found some yeah. in the Midwest. Um, the two that made it into Mexico, or I thought, were always kind of kind of interesting. Um, a lot of people think California probably suffered the brunt of, of the of the of the assault, but they didn't. You know, it was mostly here in the Pacific Northwest and, and in the Rocky Mountain states. So um, it's it's good stuff. Yes, ma'am. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, there's a museum of lighter than air uh -huh. craft, and they have they have one of them. Bomb. Yep. And I don't know whether it's one from Japan or whether it's a copy, but it's intact. I it's believe it's the original thing. From what I, 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 I know, it's the it's the real thing. 
So I think something, of course, is inside holding support in the balloon itself. Well, it's suspended. Well, I don't know, but I know yeah. it's suspended. It's in a big case. Yeah. And it's suspended from something because I was surprised at how yeah. big it was. It was really quite Well, they would have been, I think, the creep color might have made it a little bit hard to spot sometimes, but um, they were fairly easy to see. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, that's probably you know, contributed somewhat to some of the unsubstantiated reports as well, I would guess. So, any, any, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is a, uh, I had a friend uh, 40 years ago who said his father what, during the war in the U.S. was involved in manned hot air flight. They were, I oh, mean, really? our side was investigating it, and I didn't know if you, had, I don't know if they were using it for surveillance or maybe for bombing. I just wondered if you had any uh, knowledge about our uh, dirigible um, research. I know they used them as, as, um, as ways to prevent um, airplanes from getting too close to the ground. Barrage balloons. Uh -huh. um, but I hadn't heard that about us having one program like that. I know there was one later in the 50s. I think this so, was during the war. Yeah. But I, yeah. I don't know any. Well, there, were, there were balloons like that that were stationed in uh, Moffett Field, California, just mm -hmm. kind of south of San Francisco. And those were not barrage balloons, they were. Uh, Balloons to look for ships and stuff. That's right. And you're right. You're right. Now that I think about it, you're right. They would have been looking for sailors and, and airmen have been lost at sea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, so, off the coast. I don't think they used them any deeper into the Pacific. This leap. It must be, what, eight or 10,000 miles those had to go? Mm -hmm. What was the mechanism that would trigger it? to release its bomb. I, I'm, I'm a science teacher, so I'm curious to know how they could design something that would operate 10,000 miles away at, in 1943 and four. Well, I wonder um, if it was a device that was similar to what they had on bombs at that time, that they reach a certain attitude and altitude and then it um, triggered something inside that it was a barometer. A barometer? Is that yes. what did it? Thank you. That's what did it. But that, that's as much as I know about it, which isn't much. So. We'll have to go ask the Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be anxious to, I, I know they found these, these sites where they were launched after the occupation began in 1945, but, um, you know, I haven't ever read any, anything that the Japanese have ever done about this. Well, you don't read too much about what they did during the war anyway, but uh, it'd be interesting to, to talk to some of the survivors who actually worked on, on this program. Yes, sir. Um, for the unfamiliar, the 555th Parachute Infantry Regiment was an African-American airborne unit uh, formed during World War II. Now, I recall the reference, can't recall the source, that they, had, mm -hmm. they were shifted, they never made it to the front, but they were shifted to the Pacific Northwest to fight forest fires that supposedly might be caused by balloon bombs. Yeah. Anything to that, mm -hmm. or is that the cover story because the white military establishment didn't want anything to do with them and yeah. shut them aside? Yeah, I haven't heard that either. Oh. So you're, you're making me know that I have to do a lot more research. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. That's good. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you know, every Forest Service lookup was looking for those things. I bet. Yeah. I bet most of the research I've been doing lately is on the Ground Observer Corps and, uh, from the 1950s. And they, they incorporated the, the lookouts, too, into that program looking for Soviet bombers instead of Japanese balloons. Yeah, so was, they played uh, an important role in the, in the Observer Corps. I assume they played a pretty important role in this as well. Had a lookout on the Kinixu in the summer of 45. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were always told to look out for those things and of course every lookout thought they saw one but <laughs> did you see one well sure but i didn't <laughs> <laughs> but, you know I, I think you're absolutely right i think there's a lot of these things that are probably were never found and uh because who's, who's going to be in the deep woods during world war ii anyway and and uh, so i think it was probably just by chance that the hills found it in, in december 1944.
Yes, sir. Don't you think, too, sure. that the Japanese had no idea how huge this country is? You know, I think, um, I think the Japanese underestimated the United States right from the very beginning. And um, I think they probably didn't realize that even if these things had actually worked, that it probably wouldn't have caused the reaction that they were hoping. That we all know what happened after World after Pearl Harbor. That um, I think probably would have caused the same kind of resolve to either you know try and end the war a little bit sooner or, or hasten the, the Manhattan Project or whatever to uh, to try and end it a little sooner than it than it did. So um, so I, I think probably there is some kind of connection between. You know, maybe it is a lot more important than we think that if it had succeeded then, then the war might have ended up a little bit different than it, than it did or a little bit sooner. But no, I, I think the Japanese had no, no clue, you know, how big this country was and, and uh, probably what the reaction would have been if it actually worked. So, um, is, is my opinion, anyway. Um. I don't know. I just I just made the connection between this and <coughs> Montana being where the first uh, smoke jumper yeah. started. With with that, that they need, I, I, that started my my dad my dad was one of the first smoke jumpers out here, and it started uh, in 1945. They asked they went to the CO camps and asked for volunteers mm -hmm. to come out here and jump out of airplanes into forest fires, and I mean there'd been a forest service for you. And they, yeah. You know, they knew how to fight fires and everything, but... Well, I think that's an interesting connection that would probably bear some looking at, because most of where these things, you know, theoretically would have landed and started the fires would have been in areas where have only been accessible to smoke jumpers. Well, look at the at concentration there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very, that very well could be. It'd be worth taking a look at to see maybe if there is some kind of a connection. I'm finding out as I'm sitting here listening to your questions that i got a long ways to go on this one. I thought I was done. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I look at those pictures of the balloon, that the paper would have survived the humidity in the atmosphere to go that many miles, and then is still flexible when it lays on the ground, paper, right. that they had rolled it up like rice paper. Right, well, something. you know, when you look at them, they look like they're rubber, don't they? They don't yeah. look like they're made out of paper. So I assume it's some kind of a rice paper that they must have used. No, for sure, it wasn't silk. Like was no, it was it was paper. paper. It was paper. Um, makes sense too. You know, they got that little um, device on it that's supposed to destroy the balloon um, after it dropped its payload. That um, with paper and hydrogen, that thing would have just you know wouldn't have taken anything at all to get rid of them for it to go up in flames. So, but um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. I don't know how many kids it took to build one or how long it took. Um, the information that I read and research in the article was in the magazine that didn't give a clue as to how long it took the kids to make them. Would it be possible to research this in Japan? That's what I keep thinking. I yeah. think, yeah. Are, I, you are know, they friends they now? Not, would they not still be hiding that? No. I don't know. They wouldn't be hiding it. Um, I don't know what kind of record. I know the Germans kept meticulous records about everything. But whether the Japanese did that, I don't know. But uh, especially during the war years, and um, but that would bear some looking at too to see what's what's in their records. I bet there are people in the museum right now talking about it, probably. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd like to think that, but I bet they don't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. So well, it just occurred to me that you know it, it, it sounds like a, a kind of wishful thinking that you know they probably thought. Yeah, that this was really going to do something, and of course, in retrospect, it looks almost like kind of a joke. It does, way, you know. That, right. But they had to have believed, you know. And in, in a sense, the wishful thinking of like when you let go of a balloon, you make a wish. Yeah. I hope this you know, blows up <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> you know, it seems kind of facetious. In the well, you know, I, I, I guess I could see that, too. I could see having somebody bless it as it went off, you know, and <laughs> kill and maim as many as you possibly could. <laughs> but, yeah, you're right. You know, it, it doesn't really lend a, a, an aura of really reality to it, that this thing could have actually had any kind of hope at all that it was going to work. Um, well, I think it's interesting that they would think that our forests were that important to us. 
Well, I think it was interesting. The question was whether they, they didn't uh, underestimate them as well. That uh, certainly they must have known that launching the balloons during the winter time is it's going to be awfully hard to set fire like they intended it to. I mean, when it's wet, essentially. But like you said, they didn't they understand that history. Right. Didn't know when they were right. going. Well, again, they, they didn't understand that. They probably didn't. Well, they wouldn't have known that it only took three days to get here. Yeah. And, how fast they were traveling, and it could be that, that that speed that it was traveling in the in the altitude would have damaged the equipment as well, so that they didn't work. But any lower than that, you know, they never would have gotten over here at all. And so I saw there was another question around here, two, so a bunch of them. Uh, I got a little booklet here put out by the Smithsonian, uh -huh. and it's called Japan's World War II. Balloon bomb attacks on North America. Oh, okay. I don't know if it's uh, well, still available or not, but it has a complete description. Well, I, I, I didn't get to see that. Oh, it wasn't yeah, on environmental. Yeah, it wasn't available on interlibrary loan when I was trying to get. Started. Well, I think I bought this in like in the seventies or eighties. So I'll have I don't to know take if a look. Still published or not? Thank God for eBay, huh? <laughs> so, and there was a question back here. I wondered if the um, if there were enough balloons found to uh, see if, they're, if the writing on the balloons were all the same, right? or was it like Death to America? No, it was uh, it was all production oh. information. Um, okay. no, no, nothing like Death to, you know, with pictures of, you know, FDR with fangs and all yeah. that. Nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. Very, very, uh, very business-like, <laughs> I guess. Ma'am, you had a and question? And the, uh, the cordage. What? What was that from? I, I, I would assume, I don't know. Would have been um, uh, maybe a hemp rope? That probably that? a hemp rope. I don't know who manufactured that. I didn't see that in any of the, the resources I looked at. Main, the main concentration was on the balloons themselves. And, and in fact, the kids had made them out of paper. So. Some of those kids might still be alive. Yeah. It's quite possible. Um, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I don't think there's been a whole lot of interest in dredging up World War II in Japan. <laughs> it has been here, you know, or even Germany is starting to seem to get a little bit more interested in, in it. But um, but Japan, you know, I, I always hear that they're they don't refuse, they're not accepting responsibility for it any, still. But, <coughs> so I, I I don't know if that's true or not, but I think mostly it's just uh, there's just not the interest in it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this man. You know what kind of glue was used to paste all of these? I would assume it's a very Elmer's. simple what? flour paste. <laughs> Elmer's. Yeah. Elmer's. Elmer's. <laughs> <laughs> I assume it's a very simple el uh, paste, probably made out of flour and water, perhaps. No. Yeah. Probably. Maybe no. something a little better. I don't know. Flour? No, that wouldn't hold well, up. That wouldn't hold tomorrow. it. Okay. So it was some kind of paste that they used, but I don't know what, what it was. It was so, I'm, I'm up here being really ignorant now, so yeah. this, isn't, this isn't good. Aren't you going to came tonight to learn something? Yeah, yeah well, actually, it, 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 you know, I was thinking about it on the drive over here today, that this is kind of an interesting subject that's kind of, you know, maybe it's a little bit premature to drop it just now. And Have you just, published on this? Yes. In, mm -hmm. uh, and now you just found a new source. I did. I did. Yeah. yeah I, um, I just went through interlibrary loan and what I could find on it, and that that didn't come up on the on the list. So. Wow. But um, I mean, some people have done some very meticulous research on it, and, you know, fairly thick books, and and uh, you know, it was one of those cases. One of them I was reading it, and I was really trying hard to get through it, but every time I tried real hard, I started to nod off. <laughs> so, but. Um, <laughs> You, you so I should have, should have stayed awake. <laughs> you mentioned that they did the same thing to the Chinese. It, they, well, they started it. the program. They wanted. They were worked on it. I think initially to go use it against the Chinese. Did Did they implement? No, no. So they they dropped the program until 1943, and then revitalized it um, to try and, and send them over this way. Of course, by 1943, the, the tide of the war had changed as well, and, and uh, so they were looking for other options to, since it was not it was obvious they weren't going to be able to invade the U.S. at that point. So when did they find the first one? December of 1944, up by Kalispell. That was the first that one? That was the very first one. And then they found others after that. The first balloons were launched in November of that, uh, 44. 
if I'm not mistaken, that's when Johnson Flying Service started looking for volunteers in the That could be. <laughs> in North yeah. Dakota. Yeah. So any, any other questions, comments? I've enjoyed this. Well, the jet oh, I feel like kind of like an idiot up here now. So. <laughs> no, doesn't the jet stream keep going continuously? Yes. So but how, how again, they, did, they didn't really. Not pardon? China's to the west. No, they wouldn't. I don't think they would have used the jet stream for China. I don't think they would have. No, but I mean for bringing the balloons over here later on in the summer. To get to us. Yeah. At the war. There, there's some, something that they did. Of course, they didn't understand really the jet stream anyway. <coughs> But in the summer, it migrates. Yeah. It migrates north. Yeah. Goes north? Yeah. Well, I went to a lecture at the university, and uh, they were talking about the uh, B-29 raids on Japan. Mm -hmm. And they said that's when uh, the Americans first discovered the jet stream. Yep, they flew high enough to encounter uh, it. March 1945. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, I'm sure there was some question here in the U.S. about how they got here too. So, but um, they, oh, they, they call them prevailing winds, of course. But, yeah. but uh, again, there's there's real no mention of the of a jet stream at that time. So, any, any, yes, ma'am. Well, no, not not a question, just a comment. Um, if we were to look at some old barns and houses or go to a rummage sale, because I'm a rummage sale person. Mm -hmm. I wonder if I'd find something. Mm -hmm. Estate sales, you know, I think definitely estate sales, you might find something. Because, um, you know, there's a lot of odd things that I see at rummage <laughs> sales. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I've seen a lot of strange things at estate sales, too, and I always think, boy. Well, I bet there's a dozen of them hanging up in somebody's garage. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the thing I, I worry about is that if they are, you know, who's, who's really going to know what it was that, that's yeah. hanging there? Yeah, yeah, they don't know what they are. So the, why they say, why did this guy hang paper up here? Let's just get rid of it. Well, I mean that metal ring. Yeah, or the metal ring. Yeah. They, might, they wouldn't or, know what that was. Even the bomb. Yeah. Well, yeah, that would be a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I assume that some of those bombs would still be, you know, it could yeah. still detonate if we be surprised. Mm -hmm. I just read in the paper that some of the, uh, a dock and some debris yeah. from the, yeah. the uh, earthquake. earthquake and tsunami yeah. just landed on exactly. the west coast. Yeah. yeah. And so that took, what, a year or a little more than a year? A little to bit of, yeah, there's stuff washing up in, in yeah. Alaska already. I yeah. Heard too. yeah. So. Yeah. They should have put some tor floating torpedoes in the water. You know, they might have done that too. I mean, you gotta you gotta admire them for their ingenuity. I mean, really, for coming up with this idea and thinking that it would work. I mean, that's that's pretty good. So, and, you know, who knows? It might have. You know, if the equipment worked better, it might have worked. Well, they launched a plane from a submarine and dropped incendiary bombs, I think, in Oregon or Washington. Yeah. But I don't think it started any fires. No, no. And I think last time I looked on eBay, I typed in this this thing, and there was some prints of um, airplanes shooting them down, but nothing. Well, this was a, a Japanese seaplane uh -huh. that they launched from a submarine. Oh, OK. That'd be at the end, towards the end of the war, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So. Anyway, did, did, did I answered all your questions. I hope you got something out of this. I know I did. Thank you. Yeah. you. told me always end your presentation with dogs, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. And those are yours? Those are ours. They're smiling so pretty. They always smile. They're great dogs. They're happy dogs. Well, anyway, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try and answer your questions if you have any. Other.